Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final associates meeting of 2021 here at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, and I'm very grateful that you're able to join us for today's discussion with California's Lieutenant Governor, Eleni Kunalakis. Before I properly introduce the Lieutenant Governor, I want to take a few moments to thank all of you for being part of our community in another extraordinary year. I know we were all hoping to be able to gather together by now. And while there are still, I'm here in the CEPR building right now, and I wish we were here in the CEPR building, uh, but, but we aren't. Uh, but, but while there are still lots of challenges before us with COVID, I'm very optimistic that there is indeed a light at the end of this very long tunnel. And I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing many of you on campus during the year ahead. Uh, being able to stay connected through our virtual events has been incredibly important to all of us here at CEPR. And I wanna give today a very special thanks to my events team at CEPR, especially Ju Julia Huber and Tiffany Atai, as well as the crew led by Gordon Gurley at Stanford Video for their incredibly hard work and their professionalism that has made our events a huge success throughout the pandemic. Uh, and today's event is of course, no exception to their hard work. I'm incredibly honored that we have Eleni Konolakis with us today. She'll be talking about some very pressing topics, including higher education, the environment, and California's role on the international stage. We'll then dig into other areas when we kick off a Q&A session. We've been making a very strong push at CEPR into better understanding and analyzing California's economic policies with the intention that this research will help guide the decisions being made in Sacramento. Producing research that leads to better policies is core to our mission at CEPR, and being able to connect with officials in charge of the world's fifth largest economy is an extremely important opportunity and I think responsibility for all of us at CEPR. On that note, we have recently launched the California Policy Research Initi Initiative, or CAPRI for short, which is facilitating a significant amount of California-focused research here at CEPR. And we've also partnered with California 100, a philanthropically funded initiative to develop a policy roadmap for the next century of California's development. So it's really perfect that we have California's Lieutenant Governor with us at CEPR today, Eleni Kunalakis is the first woman elected as California's Lieutenant Governor, and she was sworn into office by Governor Gavin Newsom on January 7th, 2019. In addition to her duties as Lieutenant Governor, she's also California's representative for international affairs and trade. Before being elected to state office, she served as President Obama's ambassador to the Republic of Hungary. That made her the first Greek American woman and at age 43, one of America's youngest to serve as US ambassador. Her memoir, Madam Ambassador, Three Years of Diplomacy, Dinner Parties, and Democracy in Budapest chronicles the onset of Hungary's democratic backsliding. And before the Newsom administration, Eleni was appointed by then Governor Jerry Brown to chair the California Advisory Council for International Trade and Investment in 2014. She was previously a virtual fellow at the US Department of State, Bureau of Intelligence and Research between, between 2014 and 2017, specializing in international trade and immigration. And she is currently a director of the, Ameri of the Association of American Ambassadors and a National Democratic Institute Ambassador Circle Advisor. Prior to her public service, uh, 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 Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis was president of AKT Development, a housing development firm where she worked for 18 years. She built master planned communities and delivered housing to the Sacra Sacramento region's working families. She also served as a member of California's First Five Commission and the California Blue Ribbon Commission on Autism. As you can tell, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis has many, uh, has many, many achievements and lots of public service on her resume. So I could spend the whole time that we have here uh, talking about those. But let me just conclude by saying that she is an alum of Dartmouth and has an MBA from Berkeley's Haas School of Business. Uh, and she was probably as a result of that, much happier than I was about the outcome of the most recent big game in Cal versus Stanford football. Um, after we hear from Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, she and I will kick off a Q&A with a few questions and then we'll open things up to your questions, which can be submitted through the link that should be displayed right below the video playing on your screens. Uh, so with that, let me turn things over to you, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, and thank you so, so much for being with us here at CEPR today. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dugan, for inviting me to be with you and with all of you and with the CEPR community. Um, and I just really want to start right off the bat and thanking you and your colleagues for the incredibly important work and research that you are doing uh, to help provide the 
uh, data and the information for decision makers and policymakers here in Sacramento to do uh, their work uh, in our state. So what I thought I would do is start a little bit by talking about the office of the Lieutenant Governor. Not everybody really knows what it is or why we have one uh, or what I do every day. And uh, so I often get this question from people who, uh, uh, who uh, aren't afraid to ask. Um, very notably, when Governor Newsom was Lieutenant Governor, uh, a kid in, in uh, uh, elementary school asked him, what does the Lieutenant Governor do every day? And he responded by, by saying, I ask myself that question all the time. So certainly the office of the Lieutenant Governor has changed um, and does depend a great deal on the person who is holding it um, and what the focus is. But in the three years since I have been reelected, there are a couple of things that um, have really come into focus. And some of that has to do with the partnership that I have uh, with the governor, even though these are two separate constitutional offices. So first and foremost, the Lieutenant Governor sits on the board of the, uh, of the University of California, the Board of Regents. Uh, Lieutenant Governor also sits on the board of the Cal State University System. And uh, last year through uh, our efforts and working with the governor and the legislature, the Lieutenant Governor now sits on the Board of Governors for the California Community College System. So now the LG is the only person who sits on all three boards of public higher education in the state. This is something that I set out to do in order to really crystallize that this office has a very important coordinating role when it comes to public higher ed in the state of California. Um, the second thing uh, that the Lieutenant Governor does is sit on the State Lands Commission. Uh, there are only three members of the State Lands Commission and it all, the chair of the commission alternates between two of the members, the Lieutenant Governor and the state controller, who's currently uh, Betty Yee. So every other year, the Lieutenant Governor is the chair. When you are the chair, you also serve on the Coastal Commission and the Ocean Protections Council. So state lands oversees uh, control of about 5 million acres of California land. Uh, the vast majority of that is underwater, including three miles off the coast of, the, of uh, our state. So all of those legacy oil operations uh, that go on and uh, enormous amount of activities where water meets uh, the land uh, are within the jurisdiction. And as you can imagine for our state, uh, this uh, brings into focus a lot of issues around environmental protection. Um, beyond that, people often say, that the office of the Lieutenant Governor is a bully pulpit. And one area where I use the bully pulpit, as you noted, um, I am the first woman ever to be elected to this role. I had never been elected to public office before. Uh, my One of my mentors, Hillary Clinton, called for women to stand up and run for office uh, after her loss in 2016. Uh, so in 2018, I was uh, among the hundreds, thousands of women across the country who stood up and, uh, and, and ran and won. Um, and then finally, I mentioned my cooperation with, uh, with the governor. Uh, the governor uh, and I have known each other for a long time. Um, I did come out of the business sector. I came out of the housing industry. Um, I have my MBA from UC Berkeley. And so he asked me to serve on his um, Council of Economic Advisors, which I'm very happy to do. It, these are his uh, Council of Economists who advise his um, finance office on policy priorities for the budget. So uh, I have the opportunity to sit in on those meetings and really hear um, the process uh, that the governor um, puts his has put in place um, with his economic advisors and his finance department to help create the priorities, um, take his policy priorities and turn them into um, into budget priorities. Uh, and then um, I also, and this is actually, I think of everything, the area um, that probably takes up 
you know, if not the most significant portion of my time, a very large part of it. And that is, um, he signed an executive order. Actually, that's it behind me. Um, early on, just a few weeks after we were both sworn in uh, to serve as California's representative for international affairs and trade. Again, I'm a former United States ambassador. I served for three and a half years in the Obama administration in Budapest. And um, California's uh, uh, the importance of trade and investment to California cannot be overstated. About 20% of California jobs come from trade and tourism. Uh, and um, we sit on the Pacific Rim. Uh, we have extraordinary person-to-person -person, uh, contacts around the world. Uh, we are the number one destination for uh, immigrant, most immigrant populations. Uh, and we have disproportionately benefited from the United States' generous immigration policies uh, in that we are 27% foreign born in the state of California. And we are absolutely clear uh, that this has um, contributed greatly to California being the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, in addition, of course, to uh, having a very uh, rich uh, social fabric um, and uh, being at the forefront of innovation with so much talent that, uh, that comes to our state. Um, so that's a little bit about what I do. Maybe one quick word um, to add to your very gracious introduction, Dr. Dugan, um, which is a little bit about my own uh, California experience. Um, it may be no wonder that uh, I am so proud of California's um, profile of our um, immigration and, and first gen uh, uh, population. My father uh, was an immigrant. He came from Greece after the Second World War uh, from very humble beginnings. My grandmother uh, never went to school for a single day. She, she never learned to read, never learned to write. Uh, and she believed in this country and my grandfather uh, went along with it. It really was my grandmother uh, who was very important in our immigrant story. Um, but she let my father come to California as a young teenager to work in the fields as a farm worker. And he made his way from the fields of Lodi to the classrooms at Sacramento State University. I uh, didn't quite graduate. I was the first in my family to go to a four-year college and graduate, um, but he got a great education and he changed the trajectory of uh, his life and my life and in fact, I would argue um, even uh, uh, my children's life, considering I have a sophomore at Stanford right now, and you can't imagine how proud uh, we are of that. So, um, so with that, uh, Professor Dugan, I am open to your questions. Great, uh, thanks so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor. So should we do Eleni and Mark? We can do, or yeah? That or sounds great. Okay, great. So I'm I'm Mark. No, even my students, most of my students, don't call me professor after after the first class. So this is great. But uh, it's so I'm so happy to have you here and curious. Would love to hear sometime what your son thinks of Stanford. But that's a topic for another day. We're talking about California policy today. So I I've now resided in California for seven and a half years, um, and it's been uh, it's been a a, a great time. Before that, I was mainly on the East Coast, a little bit in the Midwest, um, but is, you know, it's it's really an incredible place to live, and I'm, I, I feel so fortunate to live here. Um, but, you know, we've we've got some challenges that are always, any, there's always challenges on the horizon, and, and so one, one thing that I just want to tee up for you to hear your thoughts on is, obviously, since I was myself a student, an undergraduate many years ago, uh, I'd sort of looked to California as this amazing place, uh, and as this driver of techno technology and innovation and just really a, just an incredible locomotive of economic strength uh, for the country and really for the world. Um, and I think, you know, we are hearing, and maybe this kind of always happens with California, but we're, we're, we, we hear these issues about, well, maybe California is losing a bit of its, quote, mojo uh, and, and, and not quite as... Um, nimble. And so how do we sort of keep science and technology innovation here in California when we're facing 
perhaps increasingly tough competition from places like Texas, from places like the state of Washington. Um, you know, they, these are two examples of states with much lower taxes. You hear a lot about taxes here in California. So how do we, how do we continue to, um, you know, sort of perform well? And that's not to say it needs to be at the expense of anyone, uh, but just how do we remain a, a strong positive force for, for our residents and for the nation and the world? It's such a great question. And I know it's probably one that um, you hear on campus and among um, some of the folks who uh, are involved with CIFR. Um, I had dinner last weekend uh, with some friends and, and uh, one of them is a um, big VC guy and uh, has lived all around the world. And he said, everyone is leaving California. And I said, well, really, is everyone leaving California? He said, well, everyone I know is leaving California. And I said, well, how many people do you know? Because I'm really trying to get my head around exactly what is happening. So I think that it's pretty clear anecdotally um, and from many of our experiences, we know that we are experiencing a wave of people moving around. But getting to the actual true picture of what's going on is, is a little bit more complicated than the anecdotes at, at dinner parties. And um, there are a couple of data points that have emerged for me that I found to be very interesting. One of them was last year, the post office in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco County. Uh, there was an analysis of change of address forms uh, again, this was a year ago, early on in the pandemic, a lot of people, a lot of moving vans out of San Francisco and what are in San Francisco. And one of the uh, things that this study found was that the number one place where people were moving in San Francisco was to another address in San Francisco. The next 13 counties were elsewhere in California in the Bay Area, Sacramento, even up to Lake Tahoe and Los Angeles. 14th was Houston. So that was one thing that I found was interesting uh, and important. Um, the second thing that I learned through these early, um, th these early alarms is that um, California, and this actually came from some of the um, economists working in the governor's finance department is that historically California has always had what we call churn. So some of you may know that the top 1% of taxpayers, personal income taxpayers in the state of California uh, deliver about 45% of the funds into our general fund. But every year, the actual people who make up that 1% is changing. There was always churn. And I think that you could probably go all the way back to the gold rush and see that this is the case, that people are constantly uh, coming and going. And so when I draw the lens back on this question, and by the way, I don't want to minimize in any way, I don't want to see any high income tax bracket taxpayer in California leave, right? Um, but that, um, that when we look at what this really means to our state, um, what I think is very important is to go to the elements that, um, that make California a place where we have been able to generate so much economic activity and see how are we doing in those spaces. So, um, for instance, one um, data point that I found to be uh, uh, helpful to know is that um, about of the 100 fastest growing companies in the world last year, according to Forbes, 20 of them are headquartered uh, in California. In 2020, Silicon Valley set a record with 43 startups worth more than a billion dollars. That was last year in the middle of the pandemic, 43 new unicorn uh, uh, companies. Also in 2020, 
um, 20, there was a 22% increase in applications for new business licenses. Again, this is a signal that the churn, as we hear the anecdotes of people leaving, you know, what can we hope is happening in terms of, uh, of new growth? And then the other thing that I think is important, particularly with this fellow who works in, in venture capital, is that um, he was noting that there was a time that when you looked at VC in California, if you were, for instance, in biotech, you had to be here. Now, Boston is very attractive to biotech. So there may have been these moments in the ups and downs of California's um, extraordinary history where we really capture not just a disproportionate amount of the activity in VC, but like really um, had almost a, uh, almost a, um, uh, uh, cornered the market um, where if you wanted VC, you had to come to California. So it's natural that over time, some of this would dissipate. But in 2020, California attracted more than 50% of the nation's venture capital. That is more than double the next three states combined of Massachusetts, Texas, and New York. So seeing these evenings out, seeing some folks leaving, some of them in a very vocal way can be counterbalanced, I think, by some of the things that I just mentioned. And maybe we can also talk about some of the more long-term institutional things that make California great, like our system of public higher education, uh, that we also have to be keeping an eye on uh, in order to make sure that um, even in this, I think, rebalancing and this churn, that we are having a long-term view of making sure that at, at a minimum, the churn will be able to continue. Thanks so much for that. So, uh, and and yeah, I have to say, having lived here seven and a half years, I can I've heard a lot of anecdotes, a lot of stories, but it, but, but that that data is is super helpful. And I think also, I don't know, you know, I lived in a lot of other places. It is hard to beat the outdoors opportunities here in California, and and just the array of different um, options in terms of event things with family and friends and so forth. So it's a, it's a great state. I'm a big, I'm a big fan, but we can, we can always do better. So it's so, uh, but on that, uh, on that sort of note, I want to sort of tap a little bit your considerable expertise in the international arena. Um, and you, you, you have your, you have uh, this significant experience as an ambassador in the Obama administration. They, 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 had you stay around much longer than they had me stay around. They, they only had me stay around 15, 15 months, but uh, it was it was a it was an honor to serve when I did at the Council of Economic Advisors there. But um, you know, with that sort of experience and just think about it from your lieutenant governor role, how do you think about California's foreign policy over the longer term, you know, even over the next hundred years, in terms of its initiatives, its engagement with public and private stakeholders, staffing, and so forth? And I mentioned this, as you noted, um, California, about 27% of the state is foreign born, and that's about twice as large as the rest of the US. So if you if take all other states in the US and exclude California, we're about twice as high. So it's a huge deal here. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And by the way, we have a ton of great questions that have come in. So it, it is, uh, but these are these these first few are going to be mine. So with that, uh, yeah, I'm curious, hear your thoughts. So I'll tell you, you know, I love hearing you talk about how much you like California. I, I am born and raised here. I've lived in lots of different places in the world and I love our state. And I think there's no question that the geography alone, plus all of the infrastructure that exists here, the, the physical infrastructure, but the parks and the and the open spaces and the Golden Gate Bridge, which I love to go on a walk, you know, on walks down on Chrissy Field. Like all of that is a huge advantage to us um, and, and is part of our long-term draw. But one of the other things, if there's anything I think that really makes me proud is when I walk around and I see every day whether it's going to the grocery store or walking on Stanford's campus, the evidence of being 27% foreign born. Think about that. 
one in four Californians born outside of the country. One of two of us have at least one foreign born parent and you see it and you experience it. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. And so when I draw back the lens on democracy in the world, no place is doing more to prove that people can come from anywhere People uh, can be of any ethnicity, of any sexual orientation, of, of any you know, family history or other types of traditions and come to California and show how well we can all get along um, when we have this open, welcoming society that allows for equal opportunity. And again, we're very focused on equity issues right now in the state. I know Stanford University is too. Um, equity is a, big, is a big part of it, but we benefit from having um, the evidence of the success of, um, uh, uh, of California being what we often would talk about of the success of the United States of being a nation of immigrants. So, um, so in terms of kind of the, the view of, of California and foreign policy, let me just start by saying that it's very deeply rooted in me um, that, pay, that, that the importance of American leadership in the world is, is very important. And I, I was raised a patriot in my time as a US ambassador only deepened um, my faith in our country and, I, and, our, and my belief in the importance of American leadership in the world with all of our, um, with all, with all of our faults uh, that what, um, uh, what Madeleine Albright often said, which is that we are the indispensable nation. Uh, I believe that. And so when I think about this role that I've been fortunate to take on in representing California, uh, internationally, I always start with the recognition that um, you know we, we're not looking to subvert uh, the U.S. government. Um, we uh, want to uh, deliver the California message and our priorities on the world stage, um, always to the degree that we can, um, in concert with U.S. foreign policy. But as you can imagine, there were some challenges during the Trump administration because there are, are several areas where our, our values were just diametrically opposed to some of his rhetoric, uh, starting with some of his rhetoric around immigration. Um, but more technically, when it came to the issue of climate change. So uh, this was uh, complicated for us and the way that we tried to approach engaging uh, on the issue of climate change was very much the way the Biden administration has set things up and very much how I think would be beneficial for the United States to lead on the issue of climate change in the future. And that is as a standalone issue. So I attended the Belt and Road Conference just a few weeks into um, my, new, my role as Lieutenant Governor back in 2019. And I peeled it off and I worked, by the way, with my former colleagues at the State Department, as well as uh, folks um, at the embassy in Beijing, um, to make sure that what I was doing there at the subnational level was talking about what California is doing um, on climate uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and how strongly we believe that um, everyone needs to do everything possible to deal with this existential threat to us all. So um, uh, during the Trump years, by the way, the federal government sued us and tried to strip away the ability of California to set our emission uh, standards. Now, California has set our emission standards and have this authority since the 1970s and in a bipartisan way um, advanced what we now have in our 2045 goals of being carbon neutral. We also have not just bipartisan engagement in investing in, in innovation around climate solutions, but we also have an extremely robust private sector investment 
uh, in scaling up on climate solutions. Um, so I think if there's one area where our international engagement is um, here to stay and, and very meaningful in the world, it is in our leadership and climate. And again, something I know that uh, CEPR understands is, is, uh, uh, is an, an important um, area, both for investment, um, but also for public policy in the future. Um, and, uh, and maybe actually, well, no, I, I can, we can talk about that later, but, um, uh, but um, just to, to really summarize our priorities for the state of California in, in, the, um, in our um, foreign engagement, um, there really are three areas. So it's international trade and investment. We have um, the uh, largest uh, port infrastructure in the country at Long Beach in LA. 20%, um, as I noted, of our jobs in our state come from international trade and tourism. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, third is, is climate. Thanks so much for that. I want to circle back to uh, an issue that we were talking about early on, and then I'm going to pivot to some, I hope, questions from our audience, because there are some good ones coming in related to climate, actually, but on the education front. So uh, education, I and that thank you for sharing that information about being on the three boards. That's a lot of students who attend those places, UC, Cal State, and the community colleges. That's many, 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 many Californians who attend there. So uh, what, but uh, on this- on... It's between two and a half and three million students. Right, right, that's, a, that's, that, that's great. higher and alone. Yeah. Right. No, I'm glad to hear that you are involved with all three, because also I think it's good that there's someone who is sort of in the room at all three places so that they can sort of jointly optimize so that they're not, you know, sort of working perhaps at cross purposes. It's great that you're on, on all three. Um, so California's uh, public colleges, uh, one could argue that they struggle with four year graduation rates uh, and uh, and are if you look at the K through 12 level, our graduation rate perhaps isn't where we would like it to be relative to other states. So where do you think the state should, I, I, obviously people are doing all sorts of things all the time to try to improve on, on those sorts of metrics and others, but can you talk a little bit about where you think the state going forward and perhaps in collaboration with local governments, at least in the K through 12 case, should look to concentrate their efforts to improve on behalf of our young people, you know, and, and our economy, obviously, too. Of course. So um, first, I'm sure you know, most many of you, if not all of you know, that California had a $75 billion budget surplus this year. And we're looking at another $30 billion budget surplus next year. Um, that could go up or down, but massive. Uh, massive funds um, to use the budget tool to address this issue. Uh, and in fact, the investments into education last year were historic, historic. Uh, in addition uh, to the creation of something I am very excited about is, as again, my, my kids are in college now, but um, I used to sit on the first five committee and uh, commission for the state. And those early years of development are so important. So California is um, going to have a year of uh, tr transitional kindergarten, TK, that will start in the 2022-23 school year. That's an extra year of school for our little kids. The earlier that you start them, the more likely they are going to be successful when they get into uh, into elementary school, high school, and beyond. Uh, so that is a very exciting program. Um, one data point I think that you all should know if you don't, in terms of looking at the challenges of our K-12 system, is that the Los Angeles School District, if you go to the LAUSD, um, and to the website, the first thing they say up on the website is 80% of the students in the Los Angeles Unified School District live at or below the poverty line. And I knew this 
but I was surprised recently when I went to the website and I saw how prominently they displayed that. And the reason is that with everything that we want to pull out and, and criticize relative to K-12 and you know, now TK-12 education is we have to recognize that our school district has enormous challenges of students uh, who live in poverty, students who come from households where they're the first in their family to get this kind of education, uh, and students, of course, who come from around the world, um, and I think every language on the planet is represented in the California school system. Uh, so this creates challenges that are reflected in our statistics, but of course it also creates tremendous opportunity because these kids come in and as they navigate their way through those you know there are these unbelievable success stories of students who go on to make enormous changes. Um, one small thing that I do want to point out and and again maybe some of you know this is that part of last year's budget also included um, a lunch program, a school lunch program for our kids so that every one of our kids in public school in California is eligible for free lunch. Just taking away from those kids the stigma of having to prove that they qualify for a free lunch when so many of them do uh, is a great way to signal to kids that you belong here and that you are respected and valued. It gives a level of dignity. And I'm so proud of our state uh, for, and, and so grateful to our personal income taxpayers to be able to provide that. So when it comes to four-year graduation rates, I, I could, uh, we could go into detail. Again, we're talking about a massive system of public higher ed. Uh, we're talking about a system uh, that that is, uh, you know, particularly from the community college system with the associate's degree for transfer uh, into uh, the CSU and the UC system, super, super complicated. This is not, you know, again, my two kids, I've got one at Stanford, one at USC. For them and most of their friends, the idea that it's gonna take them more than four years is inconceivable. And yet, as you know, um, at our CSU system, only about 33% of the kids who, who go directly from high school into the CSU, only about one in three are going to graduate in four years. Now for your listeners, that is might just be shocking. But six years ago, that number was one in five that students who came out of high school, directly out of high school into the CSU, only one in five graduated in four years, six years ago. And because of some initiatives that have taken place, especially reform of what, of remedial education, now those kids are graduating at a rate, so students are graduating at a rate of one in three. And the reason I think that this is an important statistic is one, yes, you are right, there are challenges. Number two, in the last six years, we've made progress. And number three, we have the capacity within government and within our public institutions to fix stuff. And that's, a, that's very encouraging. And so, uh, so again, I, there are a lot of things left to do. Uh, one of them, um, I actually had a briefing today on the technology that's being implemented that will allow students um, it's tools to plan how to graduate by how to figure out um, what classes to take and when, and allow the professors to understand when is most optimal for them to offer their courses for students to be able to take them toward their majors. Uh, and these uh, digital tools um, that have been available in private higher ed uh, are making their way into our public system now. Um, and really helping students navigate. Um, one more point, about one third of the students at the CSU are the first in their family to go to college. It's a little bit higher, it's almost 40% at the UC, and it's about the same 
in the community college system. This is unfathomable to any other place in the world that somewhere between 30 to 40% of the students are the first in their family to go to college. When we talk about this public higher education system as, as, a, um, as, as the driver of social mobility, this is what we're talking about. Uh, it definitely comes with challenges, but the opportunity is enormous. And so when I think about the long-term infrastructure for California's economic endurance, this is front and center to what gives me uh, great hope uh, that we will be able to continue to thrive. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I'm uh, so happy that you are as involved as you are with these issues, because as you said, it's incredibly important. I mean, the decisions that we make today matter not just next year, not just next decade, but for many, many years uh, beyond that. So it's, it is, uh, that's great to hear. I'm going to, I have, I have some questions from our audience, but I, before I go to that, I just have one question for you as a parent of a Stanford student and a USC student, when they played football earlier this fall, who are you rooting for? I will not be answering that question. <laughs> And as a Cal alum, so, but for the big game, for the big game, I can, is it safe to assume you were happy with the outcome of the big game with Cal handily beating Stanford? Was that? As Lieutenant Governor of the state of California, <laughs> I'm so proud of all of our sports teams. Uh, and the only team that I will say that I am, I am very openly supportive of is Stanford fencing because my son plays on that team. Wow. Okay. That's great. Okay. So we've got some great questions from our audience, including some from students. So the first question, and I, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. So apologies if you send in a question and, uh, and I don't get to it, but, um, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Uh, could you please share your vision or whatever, or the, the vision for California's role in shaping the transition away from fossil fuels over the coming decades? Sure. So thank you for that. Um, I was uh, in Glasgow. Uh, I led California's delegation. We had a huge delegation. Um, and I, first, let me just note how much people around the world look to California and what we're doing uh, in this space. Uh, and we have a lot to be proud of. So um, we started setting ambitious goals in the um, Schwarzenegger administration for emissions reduction. And we have also showed that as we have reduced our emissions, we have uh, grown our economy. So this alone makes California spotlighted and people want to know what we're doing and how we're doing it. And there are a couple of things. We have the only cap and trade program in the country, uh, which is uh, very important. Um, and that is something, again, that goes back to the Schwarzenegger administration. Uh, Jerry Brown uh, very much, actually, I'm sorry, Jerry Brown instituted cap and trade. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in the Newsom administration um, last year, he signed the first uh, executive order of its kind in the country that said that by 2035, the only new cars that will be able to be sold in California are zero emission vehicles. So in one space, you have the policy, you set these ambitious goals, but then of course you have to figure out how you're gonna get there. Uh, and that's obviously a lot harder. So um, we have incredible programs in our state where, uh, uh, where, um, for instance, our, our energy commission is um, investing in innovation. So whether it's public sector dollars going toward pilot projects and innovation, or whether it's this incredible um, private sector energy, particularly among young people um, who want to be in this space of transitioning uh, to renewable energy. There is a lot that's happening that has created this ecosystem. 
Um, and part of the reason why this ecosystem exists, by the way, uh, goes to education because we have in California, we are the largest consumer market in the country. So if we say, here's our policy, and by the way, you're, you know, companies are going to have to, uh, going to have to meet this market and we're the largest consumer market in the country. And then you have the private sector saying, well, wait a second, not only I'm going to feel good about this, but I also have the ability uh, to do well and, 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 and have a profitable co company in this space. Uh, a lot of that it, it goes together. And so for instance, let me talk about Tesla because Elon Musk has been not very appreciative of what California provided for him. And frankly, I don't think he should be that way. I think he should be a little bit more, uh, rec give a little bit more recognition to California's role in the success of Tesla because altogether he benefited by over a billion dollars in programs uh, that allowed for Tesla to succeed. So between the um, tax credits for R&D that he took advantage of and the rebate programs for people who bought those tes Teslas and by my, my husband included in that, right? And then this very um, uh, enthusiastic uh, consumer market educated in the state to believe in the importance of science and environmental protection. All of the ingredients were here for him. And a lot of that came from private, from the public sector's investment. So, uh, so these are some of the examples, but I've been to battery companies. Uh, I have been in meetings with people who are looking to invest in uh, re renewable wind, offshore wind. Offshore wind has the potential to be huge for our state. Uh, and there's a lot that you can find online of things I've talked about and others have talked about in this space and things that are happening around um, major floating offshore wind off of our state, including, by the way, a historic deal with the Department of Defense and the Biden administration, where we've now identified a great location to be able to build wind turbines, floating wind turbines with, with wingspans of up to a football field long and one and a half times the Eiffel Tower uh, to be able to uh, capture it. Um, and then let me just do one more quick plug for the importance of conservation and uh, huge investments that we're doing in our state in making sure that buildings and housing uh, are doing more to conserve uh, electricity. So I hope that wasn't a little bit too much of a ramble. Whenever I talk about this, I find that I have so many anecdotes and so many stories to tell, um, but it's exciting. And, uh, and, and I hope that all of you watching and all of you at CEPR will, will help tell the story of what California is doing. And again, um, we do control our ability to set our emission standards. And that at its root is the driver. And uh, considering there's so much bipartisan support for this space, um, I do uh, hope and anticipate that we will continue to be the place where, as the governor likes to say, uh, we are America's coming att attraction and the future happens first. Wow, that's, that's, that's great. And on the point about Tesla, we actually, a few months ago, had an event here at CEPR that we jointly organized with the University of Texas at Austin, where we contrasted economic policy approaches in California and Texas, which was a very interesting discussion. The two biggest, most sort of economically most powerful, New York might disagree, but I think they're the two, two of the most economically powerful states in the US. It was a good, uh, very good discussion, but Elon Musk's name came up once or twice that day for sure. <laughs> um, so in any case, but that, that, that was, helpful information that you provided. Okay, so we have another question. This one from uh, a, a longtime uh, California uh, resident and uh, who asking about this uh, point about out migration. So this person says, uh, the people I know who are leaving California are upset about taxes, but this person says what, it, what, what he thinks is pushing them to leave is more the decline in certain metrics of quality of life. Uh, for example, homelessness, crime, 
uh, and so forth. And so people wouldn't feel bad about paying taxes if the broader system would work better. Uh, how do we address the seeming uh, decline on those on those th those sorts of metrics? I mean, you know, homelessness and crime would be two. There uh, there are other city points too, but I'll just those are the first two that he mentions. Well, thank you, and thank you for that. That you know, really, I think helpful question, an honest question, um, and uh, there's no question that one of the drivers of out migration is home prices. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that during COVID, the median home price went up by over 35%, and the median home price in the state of California is now over $800,000, whereas in Texas, it's like 275,000. I think in Houston, it's like 450 or something. Um, but there's no question that um, if you can afford to buy a house, there and you can't afford to buy one here. That's one of the anecdotes I hear very often. Um, but there is also, I think it's absolutely fair to say that, you know, it's a human rights, a uh, human rights crisis in our state. And um, when you walk down the street, and to, for me, it's 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 a a regular, if not a daily, a regular experience where you see a person sleeping on the sidewalk. And you think, what, what is happening? How is this still happening? Why aren't we, why can't we fix this? Um, and there are a couple reasons why. One of them is the fact that over the last two decades, we have not built enough housing. Um, that is part of the crisis. Uh, my background is in housing. I know this for a fact. It is not going to be solved quickly. Though in last year's uh, legislation and over the last few cycles, there's been legislation to make it easier to build uh, accessory dwell dwelling units, uh, ADUs, and to build, um, to build duplexes and, and to increase density on something of a small scale, but, but at least it's something. Um, we also have mental health crisis. We also are a state that has a disproportionately high level of homelessness, which has something to do with the fact that we have better weather and we are uh, slightly more humane perhaps than some other states where people feel that, uh, you know, it's very dangerous to live on the street. And uh, a lot of, you know, it's, it, it's, it's dangerous. And so if you are forced to be living on the street, you might find um, that, that if you're in California, if you're in a camp with other people, maybe you can create a scenario that's a little bit safer. I know for a fact that at the local and state level, um, this issue is front and center for all of us. And there is a lot that is happening to try to address it. There is a lot of institutional reasons why it's hard to fix. There are laws around um, the degree to which we can force anyone against their will into public housing or into a homeless shelter. That is real, that is true. If someone does not want to leave the street, it is very hard to make them, even if it is in their best interest. That is one thing that is simply part of the challenge. But another part of the challenge is having enough places for people to go where they might want to go. And this has been a focus of the governor in this budget. So you might have heard of Project uh, Room Key, which during COVID, we were able to use federal funds um, to take some of these hotels and motels that were empty because we didn't have any tourists coming and put homeless people in them and provide services to support them. We have transitioned that again, largely through federal funding and the uh, stimulus money that's come from the federal government through the uh, American Rescue Act and, uh, and, and other programs that have led us to be able to transition Project Room Key into something called Project Home Key, 
All told, between the budget allocation last year and the money that's come through Project Home Key, we think we're going to be able to deliver about 40,000 units of housing existing largely through existing housing, buying motels and hotel rooms, and providing wraparound services to deliver about 40,000 units. This is a scale that is unlike anything we have had the money or the ability to do in the past. And let's just say it's a lot easier to take existing housing, you know, motels and hotels and turn them into um, housing for homeless than it is to build new projects where you have to go through a permitting process. Well, let's face it, a lot of communities, a lot of neighbors make it very difficult to permit those projects. So 40,000 units of which about 8,000 people have already been transitioned into them. This is bigger than anything we've ever done before. I am very, very hopeful. And I live in San Francisco. I am very, very hopeful that this is going to result in a noticeable difference that will make people have a renewed feeling that government is capable of resolving this in a meaningful way. Having said that, it's estimated that there are about 150,000 of our 40 million people in our state are homeless. So, uh, so I may be a little bit less optimistic about being able to resolve this immediately than I am about some of the other things we've talked about, but I am cautiously optimistic that Project Home Key uh, along with some of the uh, wraparound services and programs that have come out of this massive budget surplus will result in the kind of difference, to your point, that people walking down the street are going to be able to say, okay, we pay a lot in taxes, but we're doing a good enough job that, um, that, that, it, that, it, that it works. Well, thank you so much for that, Lieutenant Governor. And just one data point on your point about the weather being a factor for California's high homelessness. I just returned last night from the state of Hawaii. I was actually there over the weekend to participate, run, run might be a generous term for that, what happened at the end, but to participate in the Honolulu Marathon on Sunday. And it turns out that Hawaii has the nation's highest proportion of its residents who are homeless. Um, and which is sort of consistent with your with your uh, data point, according to the most recent data from the federal from the federal government. Um, and but, I don't want to put too much into the weather. There are a lot of reasons, and a very right. really high percentage of California's homeless are Californians. Right. Where they they're not going to go to another state. Right. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe I was just trying to <laughs> <laughs> brag about my. I did finish. It wasn't okay. Didn't go the way I hope. Well, yeah. Did you have a good time? Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I think I did not get the time that I wanted. I was aiming to beat my sister's PR and I did not achieve my goal, but I, but I finished and it was, it was, it was, it was fun to be there, but I just want to thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Eleni Konolakis, Lieutenant Governor of California for being with us here today. Uh, you know, as we get ready, as we all gear up for the holiday season and sharing your insights on these really important issues that are important to all of us who reside in California, not just the 40 million residents of our state, but you know the rest of the US and, and really the world. We're, I think, an important place and, and we have a big responsibility because I think we have a lot to give the world and of course to our residents through better policy. And I just wanna, I hope that you and your family have a wonderful uh, holiday season. Um, and to all who have tuned in here today, uh, thank you so much for making time for CEPR. Thank you so much for your support of CEPR. And we have lots more exciting things on the horizon, including in a few weeks after the new year, uh, the CEO of General Motors, Mary Barra, who will be speaking at an associates event and lots more coming your way in 2022. But in the meantime, I just hope that everyone who's watching today uh, has a really wonderful holiday season that you and your families and uh, that we'll, I'll get to see you, we'll, that all of us at CEPR will get to see you in person sometime in 2022. And Lieutenant Governor, I hope that we can have you to CEPR sometime in 2022. We would love to uh, uh, have you over and, and really thank you so much again. Any final words you would like to say before, before we wrap up? 
Well, I'd love to come. It gives me an excuse to go um, check in on my young man there. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, one thing I, I didn't mention, and I just like to, because maybe there are people on different, of different political parties, you know, we talked about taxes just very quickly. Um, the SALT deductions that we had in California were really important to us. And those were taken away by the last administration. And I hope that everyone watching who loves our state, who believes that California and our success in California is important for the success of the country, carries a message forward that regardless of um, who is in office in Washington, DC, that they should always be looking to ensure that California is able to succeed because beyond politics, California's success truly is the success of the country. That's a great, uh, thank you so much for that concluding message, uh, Lieutenant Governor. And once again, thanks for sharing your insights here today. Uh, it's, you know, it's really an honor to hear from you and I'm, I'm a big fan. And, and I think that, you know, anytime that you want to come by Seeper and, you know, ch check in on your, use it as an excuse to check in on your son, the door, the proverbial door is always open. So, uh, and, and we, uh, we wish you all the best uh, for the holiday season and the year ahead. And for everyone else, happy holidays and hope to see you really, really soon. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Mark.